and limber, feeling free. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Natalie Nielsen. My pronouns are they, them. I'm Evan Foreman. My pronouns are also they, them. And welcome to How to Be a Pro at Pronouns. Uh, we were told to wait five minutes or so before we jump in to allow people to arrive. So let's just be casual and relatable, Evan, and just how have you been with the world of theme parks? How are theme parks going for you? Pretty great. I'm about Pretty broad. A broad and, question, but a very broad question. But uh, it was a pretty great, uh, especially with just how everything's opening back up and being able to get a job. And so I'm about two months into a new gig as a construction engineer for a chain of amusement parks, and it's been more than anything I could have ever hoped for for the person that I am and what theme parks mean to me, and to be able to give back to these parks that I've known so much about since I was a kid, like obsessed about. So it's just like they're like, oh, yeah. do these things. I'm like, I I know. I know. Believe me, I know. Yeah. And like, I, I've been on TETV a lot doing, you know, talking about all sorts of things. But the, th the theme parks that you're, or at least the theme parks or amusement parks that you're talking about are, are like regional parks, mm -hmm. like smaller parks. Like I found, I remember that was something I, I found really interesting about you like when we met like a, a year ago or so, just that yeah. you just have this encyclopedic uh, knowledge of all of these parks that I unfortunately have never been to. <laughs> I haven't been to most of the parks I've obsessed about with either, to be, to be fair. <laughs> um, but uh, as larger context, um, I it currently moved to, hence empty room, to Pittsburgh because the new corporate office for the chain of parks is out of what is now their home park, which is this park called Kennywood Amusement Park. Uh, which just has, it's one of the oldest operating amusement parks in the country. It's got amazing, classic, just really good rides where the theme of the experience is itself. It is celebrating itself as amusement park. And that's just really unique to not only like the amusement experience, but like to specifically like amusement park history within yeah. America and then also the world because it kind of mirrors itself everywhere else. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Fun fact of the world, though, um, Natalie and I have never met in person. We have been friends virtually <laughs> for pretty much exactly a year now. It's uh, true. Yeah. Virtual hangouts. Like how how you all are seeing us. This is how this is the only way we have seen each other. So uh, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, I have a funny thing to meant to to talk about with theme parks. I actually I, I'm on YouTube a lot, watching YouTube videos about theme park history. And I watched a video recently, I think by Expedition Theme Park, and they were talking about the forgotten history of the Triceratops encounter. With How that, did you watch that? Wasn't that posted today? No, that was yesterday. It was yesterday, uh, actually. I don't know. <laughs> that says something. <laughs> but it, and it was super fascinating. For me, I was so surprised because they showed a lot of footage of like the John Hammond walk around that was, I guess, just ubiquitous in that land when it opened in like 99, I think, and Islands of Adventure. And <laughs> what I didn't realize was that there was also an Ian Malcolm walk around. There's like a Jeff Goldblum impersonator via Ian Malcolm walking around with John Hammond, like at least in this promotional footage that was in that video. And I was I was like completely just gobsmacked. I was just like, are you kidding me? I miss this. Like, obviously, you know, that for Universal is an odd. Like there's a Marilyn Monroe and Charlie Chaplin like all the time, but a go it's like basically a Jeff Goldblum walking around Jurassic Park. Uh, I could go on and on, but I won't. Um, 
within the video essay, it was like in reference to like one of the TV specials, like where it gets archive footage. Yeah, yeah, like something that was probably on like Travel Channel or something like that, oh, like those 1999. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All on no. YouTube too. It's just you get to relive your entire childhood, but through Poor, poorly, <laughs> poorly encoded four oh, by right. three. You know. Yeah. <laughs> That's all we had back then. Jeez. Right. Like, maybe internet stuff, but really it was just those travel channel specials. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, okay. It's been five minutes. We should jump in because we're not yeah. here to talk about theme parks, or are we? Uh, we're talking here to talk about pronouns in the context of how their uh, their importance to the trans community, the LGBTQIA plus community in general. Um, yeah, so let's get going. How to be a pro of pronouns, everybody. Everyone has these questions. How does it happen? Well, we're gonna get into it. Next slide. <laughs> uh, Evan, you wanna take this one? Sure, so as a disclaimer, we're gonna talk about a lot of really awesome stuff, really important stuff, but before we even start what we're about to start, we got to just, you know, lay down a few things that this is from our perspective and we do not represent all of the trans community and that this is not just it. This is not the start. This is not the end. This is not a mountain to climb and conquer to find your next tallest mountain. This is life. And to live yeah. life is to just keep going. And if you're just going to keep going, then this is a step on a larger journey and whatever that journey may be towards acceptance and understanding either of yourself or of other people, let this be another step on that journey and not the pedestal or the mountain that you climb. Absolutely. And correct me, and maybe if I'm wrong on this, to me, it feels like this presentation is, it's like you're on this just journey, you're stepping forward up this mountain of understanding and just connection with just people. And this is us holding out a hand, it's like, here, let, let me let me help you up. But then you have a, the rest of the way to go, but we're gonna get you up this one step at least. <laughs> um, yeah, next slide, please. So, so this is Natalie Nielsen. Their pronouns are they, them, next slide. They are a project manager for a themed entertainment design company devoted to the art of emotionally resonant spaces. And most importantly, and also least importantly, they once worked in a salmon cannery. It's true. Fun fact. For a whole summer. <laughs> a whole summer. Yeah. And this is Evan Foreman. Their pronouns are they, them. They are a construction engineer or a, next slide, a fun instruction NB queer, and NB, for those that don't know, NB is short for non-binary. Uh, next slide. And, and as you couldn't tell by the previous bullet point, they are the fastest pun slinger in Pittsburgh. Uh, yeah, and it's true. I, I, I'm new here, but we'll find out. <laughs> yeah, totally. And this will be evident as we move through the presentation. They'll pop up like little little, little Easter eggs, little, little, little pockets of joy. <laughs> and next slide. So what are we talking about? Pronouns, right? I mean, that's what, this, that's what the title card says. But, next slide. But like, what are pronouns? And like, next slide. Why are pronouns? And also, next slide. Next slide, please. How, how are pronouns? Like, people have a lot of questions about pronouns. Wouldn't you say so, Evan? <laughs> Uh, probably the least and most asked thing in the most uncomfortable ways most of the time. People yeah, pretty much, right? Time, but it's still ouch a lot of the time. Yeah. And, you know, obviously we're going to get into this, but I think for, for me and Evan, it's way more than that. It's way more than just the tangible, what do you do in weird situations? What do you do in like, you know, it's always these in these like uh, contextual situational, like, you know, uh, scenarios. And we'll get into that. But I think for us, we want to get a bit broader. So we go to the next slide. This is how we kind of are framing this whole this whole presentation. So there's the outside world. And for our audience in particular, at least the main the ma audience that we're mainly marketing towards, it's you know, not, not a majority, but, you know, cis people usually, cis meaning um, people that are aligned with the gender they're assigned at birth. So, you know, 
if you've been given the the gender of, of man or male, I mean, and you feel good about that or a woman, you're a cis person, nothing wrong with that, but that is your perspective and you are belong to the outside world in this instance. And what we're doing is that we're bridging the gap here, next slide, to the inner world that me and Evan and so many other people occupy that belong to the uh, trans and gender non-conforming community and any other people that, you know, align with uh, using unconventional pronouns with their gender that they're assigned at birth. Um, but the thing about trying to communicate the inner world of a trans person is that it can be very confusing to someone who isn't living it. Uh, it can feel very surface level to the outside world. It could just seem like, you know, it, it can range from being confused by they, them, that's, that's a, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's plural, but you're one person, what the crap, to like, all the way to the other end where it's like, well, that's not a person, right? But we try to stick to the people that are like, you know, open-minded. And this is kind of the visual, right? It's just a bunch of shapes, some things you might recognize, but overall very difficult to understand. So what we're gonna do is take this perspective of the trans experience, uh, next slide, and recontextualize it into a uh, theme park vernacular, into the perspective of, uh, the guest experience as in essence, right, Evan? Mm -hmm. So, you know, like I said, this audience knows theme parks generally. And I mean, even if you don't work in the industry, you've been to theme parks. So let's talk about them. Mm -hmm. Theme, like I said, there's those pockets of joy. Theme, let's talk about them. You know, the thing you need to be uh, aware of is that you as the audience are being invited in to our experience as trans people and what was next? I don't remember. Yeah, but first, what Evan? Right? What, what do you need before you you go into a theme park? Because basically, the whole idea is we're recontextualizing a trans person <laughs> as a theme park to try to communicate these ideas. Is that right? Correct. And so, as we would do that, you would need a means of access. You would need a proof of admission in order to enter the gates of a theme park. And so, in a very similar way, we've created what is a ticket to entering our inner world for the time in which you are a active participant of that inner world. And so here is our ticket. And with that ticket, we're just gonna go down the line. And if we go to the next slide, be a star, the ticket, it starts with the ticket. We're gonna just spell it out. It's really fun. And it hopefully is a mnemonic device that we felt very inspired to create and to share as a way, because we're not out to get people. We're not trying to trick people. Nobody here is angry. No one, no one here is anything more than hurt and anxious when, when something invalidates uh, us as how we identify when it ultimately distills to something as simple as pronouns while being trivialized for something as simple as that. And so mm -hmm. the best way to enter that experience is to start with ambiguity, is to, you're not sure how they identify, well then why identify them? When if the interaction is at such a beginning instance of the start of whatever the encounter is, that you can just, whatever that interaction be, leave it at that and then if it continues further than that, like let's say you're having a longer, longer conversation than like asking for directions, for example, you would then, because this is part of the larger experience of if you're not ready to go to the next step, you don't have to spend all your tickets in one place because the whole point is that you return to the theme park and this is your ticket. You return to the ticket. And so, you know, like a e-ticket Disneyland kind of classic ticket book, we go to the next step. We go to the next attraction. You tried out the, the carousel or like the, the D ticket attraction and now you want to go to e-ticket and so forth and things like that. So you go to the next slide or the next ticket and, and let's say you've talked for a couple of minutes. You want to better understand this person and you're unsure, but you don't want to clock them. Time to ask for their pronouns. And that is as simple as in the casual conversation, what are your pronouns? And an important thing to note is that some people in those interactions don't feel comfortable sharing their pronouns, but it's a person, place, or thing, and it's the word to replace a person, place, or thing. So just replace the replacing the word with the actual word. And if a person opts out uh, in terms of giving you their pronouns and allowing them into that inner space, it is 
within your means 100% to politely respect that and say, Jeff over there, Jeff is, Jeff, 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 Jeff. And yep. then yep. The pronouns there. It could still sound like a man's name, but is it a man's name? That's not for you to decide because it's, it's subjective and it's not for you to be the language police or to police other people on something that they are self-advocating. Yep. That being said, Suppose it goes super duper great, and then now you have learned this new, very intimate thing about this person whom you want to respect in the same way that you do that thing where you learn a person's name and you hurry up a new name and you want to remember it because you hate forgetting names. And you go, their name is blank. Their name is blank. Their name is blank. See how I use gender neutral pronouns to remember whoever their name was, and it's irrelevant to what their gender is unless they specify that their pronouns are they, them. So that being said, here we are at accepting and internalizing their identity, as I just did. You repeat it to yourself and get to the last ticket and it takes it all the way home and right back to the beginning and at our repetition through mindfulness. Yeah. It's not something you cheat. It's not something that is, again, the next mountain to climb. It's just thinking about it for more than just the automatic response. And that takes time. Obviously it takes time, but again, Going to a park takes time. Coming back to a park takes time. All of it is a larger journey than just walking down the street to your community garden. It's this entire guest experience through which you are interacting with someone like me or someone like Natalie, or just anybody in general. But in this instance, we are talking about people of the trans community. Yeah. yeah. And Absolutely. that being said, we can go through it one more time and it's just be a star, start with ambiguity, time to ask for their pronouns, accept and internalize their identity, and repetition through mindfulness. Is there anything that you'd like to add, Natalie? Yeah, I think, um, and we're gonna touch on these continuously throughout this presentation, but I think a lot of the questions that I've been getting from a lot of people about pronouns when it comes to trans people is that people are very afraid. People are very afraid to, um, to ask in general and i think um the for me and i think I, I if i if i if you had uh, said this forgive me evan but i think the way to recontextualize pronouns is that it's just like asking someone's name you know i mean obviously that can be nervous too you forget someone's name and stuff like that but i think it should be approached with the same casualness and that just as an individual is identified by their uniqueness of their name that should be how you think about pronouns and that it is, even though it's as unique as it is, it is a mundane thing to do. Um, yeah. <laughs> Diane, don't be afraid. Oh, what's up? <laughs> Important footnote. It is not a preference. It is our truth. And if it yes. is our truth, it is not a preference. And yeah. so just get that language out when you ask for it. Cause I understand that there might be information and it is sometimes conflicting, but just, Please understand that coming from the bottom of our hearts, <laughs> it is who we are. Yeah. And we wouldn't be who we are if we literally couldn't help that. So with that, let's get to the park. Let's get to it. Ooh. You're in. You're in. Oh, you, 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 you expand your ticket. They, you know, you're, you're here. You, you drove, how, how long did you drive here? Like six That's hours? So like, long. Like oh, way too long. Oh my gosh. Uh, but you made it and you, you you successfully implemented the steps in the ticket and you will continue to. There's confetti just for you. And you're our guest, be our guest. <laughs> I think um, just to speak to this specific image that we chose for this slide, the thing, the main point we're trying to hammer home with this little section is that you like you're, you're we have welcomed you in to this experience that we have but you're still a guest. And with that in mind, trying to relate it back to how theme parks are, you know, uh, the, the idea of them, they have different sorts of rules, right? They have different social rules from the outside world. Obviously, you know, it's not like murders like allowed or anything like that. It's like everyone possesses different roles as, as soon as you enter that gate. And the most distinct two are cast member and guest, right? And like, I feel like uh, uh, people that are used to theme parks are very, you know, they're used to this idea. You know, there are people that are willing to help you and there's people that are there to consume experiences and spend money and capitalism and all that. Um, and 
there is a respect for that. And I think for us, as we proceed forward, uh, what's the next bullet point? Right, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, getting a little, oh, I'm losing my, losing my steam. Evan, can I throw it to you? <laughs> sure. Great, so, thank you. As a guest to our experience, you are assuming the role of guest. Not that we are cast members, just to say that we are literally a theme park. So larger than that, you are, you are within this relationship welcoming yourself to a curated experience of what we have shown you. And so beyond those boundaries, there are things that are off limits. There are things that are under construction and uh, there are people who are working on those with us. And those are the cast members. Those in a sense could be our allies, our doctors, our care providers, etc. And so next slide, please. All of this circling back to this is a trans theme park, fundamentally different from the cis perspective. And so as a result, to understand the experience is to assume a role that is homogenous to anything outside of what you understand. And so that when we get to the next slide, what we're asking is just to leave your bias at the gate throw it in the trash, get some new stuff. As Natalie said, capitalism, we're here to spend money, not, you know, we don't wanna lose the meeting, so let's get to the next slide. Yeah. Is that it's, it's, you wanna open yourself to a new way of thinking about this identity. That is what you're here to do. And so next slide, stretch out those legs. You're gonna be doing a lot of walking. There's a lot of long switchbacks to a lot of really cool rides and we should see it all, we should do it all because it's you know at your own leisure at which you do this experience, which is what's so unique and awesome and fun about amusement parks and theme parks is that it's a giant fun factory. Like you just get to go and do stuff and try new things and your input and output, you exit happier, thrilled, scared, but like the fundamental difference is that all of these are emotional experiences and so is being a trans person as it is being a person, but Sometimes it's hard to understand what those experiences are for us. And so we continue our experience through wayfinding. Mm -hmm. Wayfinding, what is it? It's, it's, it's how you navigate. It's, it's, it's semiotics. It's understanding signs and what their meanings are and how to respond to them in terms of gaining direction about how to navigate a place, a space, or a person. But you can get a little lost. Sometimes there's these crisscrossy signs, as you can see, and they're just pointing every which direction. And you just want to know where the nearest food stand is. Do you ask for help? Do you look for a map? Do you just sit down and start crying like the four-year-old in heat stroke on a hot summer day? Maybe, Maybe. but probably not. You probably ask for directions. And that's what we help more people over time as they become better educated and more confident with subjects outside of their own competence, that they feel safe in asking these questions because they know how to ask the question in a way that makes the person who was being asked the question safe. Yep. And then everybody feels good. And then we move on to the next slide. Yeah. Pronouns in this sense are wayfinding for our identities where it is not the beginning or the end, but it is a start. Yeah. in terms of understanding where I'm at. And what it means is you have taken pause to be mindful. And so if we get to the next slide, different pronouns to be used for that. And so we can click through these, just, you know, there's she, her, there's they, them, there's he, him, there's neo pronouns like Z, Zim. There's no preference as we talked previously. And it's not a definitive list. And not, so, not by any means. <laughs> Slides, by the way, I just want to throw kudos to the person handling our deck right now. Thank you, CJ. Um, and then, so, you know, next to slide, and it's just, you know, not sure where to start. Eh, eh. Ah, ah. <laughs> and so, you know, you get lost. There's sometimes a map even on your ticket, or it's like, you know, QR code to a website in your phone. It's, it's integrated in a way in which that in this curated space as a, of a theme park, at least a well-designed theme park, there is purposeful wayfinding that helps you navigate the space, whether it be through the pathways and how they're designed, where the bathrooms are located, where the trash cans are located. Everything is meticulously curated for you to see. And all you have to do is just enjoy yourself. And so what do you do? 
And if you're lost, you ask a cast member for directions. That the next slide. And so you know that that just to give you a sense of what wayfinding is, and that this is again a way of better navigating our space. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, and just, just, you know, to support everything that you've been saying, it's like, you know, you should feel as, you should feel as comfortable as you uh, asking a trans person what their pronouns are, as you would any costumed, you know, cast member in Disneyland where Ma the Matterhorn is and you've never been there, you know, like it's that, that's like the one-to-one -one we're really trying to communicate. It's just like, it should be that automatic it's like i don't know what to do well the the person is right there and i tell you if there's one thing i am more frustrated by is when someone is afraid to ask me questions because you know I i'm here i'm friendly and literally i could not be more terrified than you are in your moment of being afraid of messing up <laughs> and the second that a cis person you know what decides to reach out and ask and like show that care like that alleviates any and all tension and like believe me like it it, it is it is if you want to be like a good ally to trans people that's like the first thing top of the list it's the ticket like well it's the second but even still yeah 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 but even still it's like um yeah it should be like that it should be that instinctual don't be afraid of hurting our feelings. If we don't, as you know, I'm speaking colloquially for other trans people. If if there's a person who's trans who doesn't want to tell you, they won't. You know, this is just about establishing boundaries, and this is how that starts. You know, and it shouldn't be taken in any offense. It's just that's their boundary, and then you refer to them by their name. It's that simple. I'm done. <laughs> Cool. Uh, and a good point to reiterate what you were saying is uh, easy expression. They're over there. Oh, yeah. There. Oh, my gosh. Do we want to go back to this all the time? And then they like pause for a second. And like, oh, shit. Yeah, I did just use it in a neutral way. But because yeah. it, it's usually like that, you know, seizing of whether it's a plural or a singular. But they're over there. They're over there. One of, well, definitely one of my favorite one uh basically just to reiterate this is is someone has an I issue with they them pronouns right and we'll get to this but i think let's just hit on it uh the example that i learned from a friend of mine um a couple uh weeks ago uh the example they gave to their parents who was having who were having a hard time conceiving of like they them as singular was the idea of someone knocking at your door and you know you don't know who it is and you're like let them in and as far as you know, it's just one person, correct? And you said, let them in. <laughs> you know, it really, it's its a, it, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've navigated, we've found our way. We have wandered, got lost a little bit, found our way again, picked up a churro, and now we're at some of the best parts of what we go to theme parks for. And that is obviously the rides. Absolutely. And, Bear with us because we did a lot of really creative thinking here to recontextualize this experience. But let's ride some rides. What are rides? What are They're rides? Experiences and they elevate our everyday experiences. They take us from the normal and transform us into heroes, into princesses, into adventurers and wizards and all kinds of cool stuff. But there's long lines. Is it worth it though? It absolutely is worth it. Oh, it's absolutely worth it. It's every so time. Fun. It seems like so much work. It seems hard. It is. Those switchbacks can be brutal. Like when you bump your hip, zigzagging all the time. Oh, well, and just the immensity of it. It just, oh, it yeah. just keep going. Have you waited in line and long line for Ghost Rider at Knott's? Oh, my goodness gracious. But it's worth it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So what do we get out of these transformative experiences? What are they to a guest or to a designer or to an operator or a mechanic, all these stakeholders, all of these are very different perspectives on the singular entity of this transformative experience. You know, to the guests, they're coming in expecting to be thrilled, wowed, shaken in a box and thrown out into a gift shop. To a designer, it's throughput and, you know, hourly capacity and, you know, getting a certain, EBITDA at the end of the year of, you know, 
return on investment and all that kind of corporate jargon for that side of theme parks. To an operator, it's, uh, you know, just what, what's my shift or, you know, the most distilled version of that. Is it easy? Is it fun to operate? Is it keep breaking down and I don't know why and I have to press all the buttons at once until a mechanic comes? Or is it a mechanic being like, this piece of junk? All of these are different stakeholders, but all beholden to this transformative experience. And so what does that mean if we make that about us? Now, Ludi, do you want to go? Yeah. So I think what we're really uh, hitting on here is gender euphoria. So the 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 definition that me and Evan and has kind of, we've kind of comp compiled together after extensive research online that took over the course of like a half an hour. Uh, what we came to in our own personal experience, obviously, uh, gender gender euphoria is the feeling a trans person gets when they present as the gender they identify as, and people treat them accordingly, and the individual recognizes this in themselves as well. That's the important part. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. It's wonderful if people see it, but really, for me, especially, you really feel the gender euphoria when you recognize yourself after not really seeing yourself, especially like in the mirror or in pictures or video or whatever, for so many years. Um, and I mean, basically, what we're trying to kind of get at here is uh, rides in the context of a theme park, in the context of long lines leading to a euphoric experience is what it's like as a trans person for this, this ultimate like prize almost of gender euphoria. Go to the next slide, please. Because, you know, going to the theme park is fun, but it takes a it's lot hard. of work. It's hard. Like your feet hurt waiting in these lines. Like, I don't know who, how many of the, in the audience have been to Spaceship Earth in, in Epcot in, in Orlando. It's it's oppressive. It's just switchbacks. It's the worst. But it's also like the most like perfect epitome of like Epcot as like the the initial you know whatever. It's it's perfect. It's so emotional. You know the other image, more switchbacks. Again, it's so oppressive. But what is it? What it, like is? But again, like we said before, what is it worth it? And you go to the next slide. Yes, it is. It's these incredible like like uh, situations and, and and experiences that you'd never think you would ever be able to experience in what you would you know perceive as a mundane life something that seems so outside of your experience or that seems that just elevates you out of your just you know day-to-day -day existence i mean that's why these things are so popular to begin with right and so go to the next one. Yeah, all three, right? Like just the disney trifecta here. Just like it's just you go fast and you're feeling good and you're smiling and it's worth it despite the wait long line. So I think what we're really trying to address here is like this quite well. And then also uh, this can also cross over to like like the the contextual situations like Evan was speaking to, like with designers. You know, it's a lot of work designing these attractions. I mean, we've done it either on the operational side or like the design side, making these packages, delivering them to clients, dealing with these meet meetings. I mean, it's all so oppressive, but it's you know in your heart of hearts, this is what you've always wanted to do and it's worth it. And so for us, uh, being a trans person, I think some some people, as I have gotten the question, like it just seems like a lot of work. It seems real, like like so much trouble, like is it, really, is it really worth it? And what we're really trying to communicate here is that yes, it is. It's oppressive and it's difficult and it's full of like so many emotions you're you're letting go of these ideas of yourself and these like seemingly like rock solid like you know uh ideas of yourself and basically and you're allowing something else to to come forth and take its place you know and you become a different person and it's incredible i mean it's giving birth basically and that's an incredibly painful process but in the end and then amidst all of that internal work, but the world is horrible to trans people. We shouldn't kid ourselves. It's really hard out there because we're not, you know, we have we support more support than we have had in a while in a, in a while. But in general, you know, we're othered all the time, and it hurts. You get stares, and it and it's and it's it's you know you you start to question: Is it worth it to your to yourself? But then you pass by a mirror, or you see a picture. And you're like, oh my God, that's me. <laughs> I've never felt that before. I mean, it's it's the the descent on a roller coaster. It's crossing this 
bridge in Indiana Jones while Mara is trying to kill you with this fucking laser blast and there's lava and there's music swelling. It's that, you know, that's, that's what it is. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. It's so difficult. And yet I wouldn't trade it for anything because I get, we get ourselves and we've never had that before now, you know? And it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I mean, to relate it back to rides uh, again, yeah. not that it wasn't, but just. Oh, no, of course. I go big. back into rides. Bring it back. On Ride Photo is a snapshot of what the euphoria is of us seeing ourselves in the mirror for the first time in quite possibly our whole lives. There you go. I can say that I was hiding behind a lot of boundaries that I created for myself that I thought I was protecting myself from. But in reality, I was suffocating myself from who I could be. And as soon as I let go of that is the same as when you put your hands up on a roller coaster and you're just truly free and liberated from whatever is burdening you, literally lighter than air yeah. uh, in like the scientific sense. Uh, as like, you know, you are, you are ejector airtime, airtime, you are, you are flying. Yeah. When you get to fly, except at theme parks. And in a sense, that's how we feel. We feel like we are flying. And so why limit that ability to soar yourself? Uh, and so that is, that is what we ask of ourselves. That's what we ask of other people when, when engaging with us is, is why bring us anywhere other than where we are and why can't we meet together somewhere in the middle and have a good time and be around a bunch of other strangers on a roller coaster screaming our heads off. Exactly. And, uh, and by, by the way, like when we figured out this metaphor, like we were so excited because it made so much sense to us. I want to mention too here, uh, as much as like this metaphor is meant to communicate to people who don't have this experience as trans people. Um, and we're really trying to like bridge that gap of understanding. We're also not trying to diminish how much bigger it is than this description. <laughs> like it is, it is an unwieldy concept of, 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 of self and of identity. And this is um, this is a small crack through the veneer of like, you know, disinformation and fear that we're trying to feed to people of like, this is what it's like, but don't think that it ends with that because it's that and so much more, so much more than it's really hard to describe. But like the broad strokes is this <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, that's rides. Rides are great. Rides are like amazing. Uh, that's what you go to the park for. The rest is F and B. And not to say that people don't go to theme parks for food, but a new restaurant doesn't, you know, make a theme park have like you know twenty percent jump in attendance than like, let's say, like Harry Potter World. Yeah, exactly. The F and B in Harry Potter World, but like the pretext is that part of the experience has to be rides. Because if you have a park with no rides, you then have a festival park, and then you have to have well, what ultimately is Epcot and nowadays until their next rebrand. You get the idea. For sure. Shall we? <laughs> Let's keep going. Yeah. Let's keep going. Bad right. house. It's the place where the work exists, as we've kind of been referring to as we've gone through our talk today. This is, uh, next slide, the hidden space where the heavy work is done. You don't see it. It's, it's, it's cast members only. It's, it's unseen, but still important. And if you go to the next slide, this is, this is our inner life. This is me at home. This is the part of me who you don't see. The part of me for those who might be watching where it's I've interacted with you somewhere. And that, and that interaction, it was a performance. And that's not to say that I wasn't being myself, but I have to behave and act in certain ways in certain situations to be treated with respect, regardless of whether or not you could be the kind of person who doesn't see people as blanks and everybody's a person kind of thing. But at the same time, that can be very dismissive because you should respect people for who they are and not just say, I don't care. And that indifference, that indifference is almost worse than hate sometimes. So that being said, stay out unless invited in. Like you're a VIP or you're paying for that tour. I'm not saying like, well, you're paying for the tour of my inner life, but just that, you know, let's say, you know, my, my access to backup house in the current role that I have, it kind of always feels like I'm sneaking in to, to the park that I'm working at. Cause I don't like work for the park itself, but I work for the chain of parks, which means I go to that park, but 
you know, most people on a day to day basis that are working at that park, you know, at the front line at these the operations and whatnot, those seasonal employees, they don't really know who I am. And so, you know, it's kind of like a trespassing in a sense, even though you're not because you're exactly where you're supposed to be. And so, you know, same, same, but different to this is just you'll know where you are and you'll know whether or not that is a place where you're not allowed to be. And those boundaries are as simple as the sign that says, stay out. Uh, and then no, wait, Natalie, I, I love the reference that you put with the graphic. I want, I want you to share. Oh, this whole graphic. Oh yeah. yeah. No, I, I love this thing. Uh, our graphic designer, Emily. Oh gosh. I, I am so bad with names. Lee. Emily Lee. Uh, was the the yeah thank you CJ and thank you Evan uh, Emily Lee was the person that designed this whole graphic identity and I had this vision of this slide where there's a tree and a fence with the door with the no sign and the big building that is ref and that is green that is referring to the color of the uh, big back of house buildings that Disney um, well, well the back of house buildings they paint them green they paint them this shade of green called go away green which is this color theory idea like this green, your eye just kind of glazes over it. So the next time you're in a Disney park, pay attention to the, the big buildings that you see when you're arriving there. You'll, they'll tend to be this shade of green, not this specific shade of green, but a green. But speaking of paying attention though, in the next slide. Oh yeah? Oh yeah, we have something called hidden history. Oh yeah. <laughs> which is, you know, what, what is that history? What is that in the context of us and theme parks and how do we honor and celebrate that past while looking towards a better future through visual references like Easter eggs, hidden Mickeys, et cetera. For example, in this little graphic off to the side, we have um, Wendy Carlos, who was the sound designer for the original Tron film, who also to us is a member of the transgender community. And so to us, in a sense, this kind of reference within this presentation is what if us, the theme parks, and there's not many of us, except for at least to our knowledge, in terms of how we've met each other, yeah. Natalie and I are a very few. And so that kinship, uh, it makes it very hard to look towards a larger family. And so, I mean, that's the same with a large part of marginalized affinity groups. And so with, with that, this hidden history, it's, it's that visual reference. It's that, it's that sense of knowing where to look and what to look for and to point it out to somebody and be like, Hey, here's a really cool thing that somebody put there because they knew I would find it. Um, <laughs> and so the ways that you can, you know, recontextualize that into what we're talking about is that this is diving into queer history and having an appreciation of context. It's learning about those figures and those events. And, you know, it's, it's like knowing about gay days at Disneyland, for example, or about the way that same-sex dancing was segregated and the larger history of how that ties into like nightclub teen culture at amusement parks where originally it was part of big band at the turn of the century until it was like the seventies and eighties when it was teen dance clubs. But then it was also homophobic teen dance clubs in the seventies and eighties. Uh, and you don't really see dance clubs at, amusement parks nowadays, but not that we're going into a history about that, but I just, there's a larger history than what you know, and it's there for when you look for it. And in that way, there's always a secret reference within ourselves and the trans community in terms of like what that means in the way that any pride flag, every color has a specific meaning, but you would only know what that is if you chose to look it up. And then otherwise you still see it for the pretty flag and painting and portrait that it tells through the color story. Yeah. So you, it's, your, it's yours to decide. And, and even deeper, that hidden history, uh, Natalie, we'll touch on more in the next slide. Oh my God, yeah. I mean, j just to, and next slide, please. <laughs> and just to, to, to speak to like what it's like, like basically like the, the, the metaphor, right? Is, you know, as, a, as a, an ally or as someone who is, you know, trying to be uh, friends with or support trans people, you know, there is the asking of pronouns, there is, you know, the more, more surface level stuff. And for me, oh, no, not yet, not yet, not yet. Go back, please. <laughs> for me, that is, but then there's an opportunity to like appreciate a trans person more. There's an opportunity to hey, give more context uh, for their their lives, their identities, and their, how they're tied to the greater culture. And for me, that metaphor, it tries directly back to the Haunted Mansion, which is one of my favorite rides at Disneyland. Um, and more specifically, the stretching room, which is the, the means in which 
guests are conveyed into the ethereal world and, and such. And, you know, it's a great moment and it's a great ride. And you can be a big fan of the ride as it as it is, right? But you can also suddenly get really curious and start to kind of dive into like, well, how 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 did this, this clearly wasn't a bunch of ghosts. This, this room wasn't like, it was, this, something's happening here. And so, you know, next slide, please. And then, you know, through, through uh, you know, research, you can discover the stretch room is actually an elevator. Spoiler alert to those that don't know. And it lowers you beneath the berm around Disneyland and gets you into, next slide, please. This big warehouse, you know, which is incredible to even think about, but like, and then, and then you can go back to that ride, you go back to that park and ride that ride and appreciate the ingenuity and the art that went into crafting this experience that like fully immerses you and like confounds your mind to even think that like such an experience could be housed within just a little house or had it been more. And you know that now. And you know, for some people it's different when it comes to theme parks in general. Some people like to have the magic, you know, just res restored. But I feel like for a lot of people in our audience, those that work in the industry, they like knowing. And in it, in it is in it either was the beginning of their path or it just continues to foster more deep thinking about how you make experiences. And so, you know, metaphorically, there's lots of books out there about trans people, about our history, about our lengthy history, about the oppression we've, we've felt throughout history. And it doesn't hurt to pick one up, to learn, to learn something and to kind of understand, you know, even deeper than what you can learn from us as individuals. Because I don't know everything about trans people. But I know some things. Nor do I, nor are we representatives of the whole community, as we've said. Exactly. <laughs> Which means that if you really truly want to respect not just me for me or them for them or us for us, it's to do that work yourself and take something with you. Yeah. And so with that and with our journey and with it tying back to theme parks, obviously, we... <sighs> I've done a lot of walking. We've done a lot of writing. We've done a lot of screaming. Gosh, so tired. What, 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 what's the, what do you do when you when you are leaving a park or a major theme park attraction? I want some stuff. I want some stuff. <laughs> Exit to the gift shop. <laughs> and so, let's say we're exiting the theme park at large, not just the individual ride experience and uh, visual reference that really motivated this part of the presentation is this exit sign at Islands of Adventure, uh, where the adventure lives on. It, it, is, it is saying that it doesn't just end here. You take what you've experienced, what you've learned, you keep it with you, you keep it dear, and you take it with you. You share those experiences, you share those memories, you are taking ephemera and tchotchkes and the ticket pictures or you know like all, all the things that you take with you from from your theme park experience those are those are what you share with the world and so as you take that with you what are you what are you bringing with you're bringing all of these things and most importantly lessons what you've learned about yourself mm -hmm. even if that's not necessarily what you would explain to somebody when you're telling them about how much fun incredible Hulk coaster is or something like that but at the same time that lesson is what you're telling yourself, even if it's not something that you are articulating through words to other people, because the most that you could even admit to other people maybe is not what you can even admit to yourself. But at the end of the day, all you can say is, that was so scary. My eyes were closed the whole time. <laughs> and deep down, you're like, oh my God, I think I, I, I really surprised myself. I didn't think I was going to be able to ride that today. I, I was, I was almost going to not even, I was going to walk right off. I was not, you know, my friends would be so bored of me, but like, no, this was for me. I did this for myself. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the, you know, intangible concepts that you take with you when you leave a park and you exit through the gift shop and you take with you, cause you can put those into physical objects that help you remember. But at the same time, it's still yourself that you're taking with you everywhere you go. Next slide. You want to take it, Natalie? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, speaking to what Evan's been saying, I mean, what what are we taking from us when we leave this particular park? 
when we leave an uh, interaction with a trans person, when we leave, we part ways and we've opened ourselves up to the opportunity to get to know them as people, to not see them as harbingers of fear and, and like, you know, conflict, but like people that just have a different way of experiencing life and that could offer different, uh, you know, different ways, right? So what other kinds of ways? So, well, let's, let's get into it. First off, it's the ticket, right? Like this is just us going back through. So let's just start from the top. It's start, it's start with ambiguity, time to ask for their pronouns, accept and internalize their identity and repetition, repetition through mindfulness. And the idea here is you're taking this ticket with you. You know, it's like as much as you would buy a snow globe, you would also have your ticket stub. You'd have your things, right? So you have these with you. I guess the difference here is that in Disneyland, you gave them up, but these are metaphorical. So you keep them. <laughs> um, yeah. And so going. continuing with that, this is just really to remind everyone that decenter oneself because it's not about you and that the things that you can take with you as you continue this experience is to, for example, gracefully correct a pronoun error and move on, whether that be yourself or someone else in the room who made the mistake. It's not my or Natalie's or it's not, it's not on us. We shouldn't have to, because if you were an ally, you would speak up for somebody who in the very same way would, you know, their name's Natalie, not Natalina. I just, poor example, but just for example, like pronouns right, name wrong. You would still correct somebody if they gave you the wrong name. Exactly. So it's as simple as that, which most importantly means don't be weird. It's really easy. <laughs> it's like, again, I think, and it ties right back into we're, you're not as afraid as we are. We are terrified to move about this society because people don't, it's hard to know when people really are accepting of us because you can be really accepting of a lot of things, but then you have that one thing and that one thing is us. And that can be really tough to navigate. So to not be weird, it's just like we're people, you know, gracefully move through our your experiences with us. We're not going to bite your head off. <laughs> you know, we're people. That's it. Oh, this and this so, one's this one's fun. <laughs> everyone gets is everyone else's boo boos and ouches. We all navigate life much easier, and so it's you true. think about like, stepping on someone's toes. No one intends on stepping on someone's toes. Like no one's like walking in line on a sidewalk with your friend, and you accidentally like step on the back of their shoe, and it like their foot kicks out of the shoe. No, who in the right mind is deliberately doing that? Unless you're a really really bad person. But let's just say no one in this presentation who's watching us right now is a really bad person. You would apologize profusely because you would not want that person to think that you are someone who intentionally is stepping on people's feet. Right. In the same way. Yeah. Don't step on your toes, please. Yeah. And if you misgender somebody who has who is trans or has different pronouns than what you perceived, which you know, ah, go back to the ticket ambiguity. Uh, yeah, gracefully apologize. Or no, no, you know, it's not even apologizing. It's saying thank you. Thank, you, thank them for correcting you and move on because ultimately they're not criticizing you. They're just correcting you. And I think there's a there's kind of a weird connection there of self-worth and being right and wrong. And in this instance, being wrong is just an opportunity to grow. It's not an opportunity to be demeaned or to be chastised. It's yeah. not. And being wrong doesn't mean you are wrong. No. Like, W. You are not a bad person. We are not attacking you for correcting something that we see is in error. Because if it is in error, it is us correcting an error, which is the same way that anybody can make a mistake. Yeah. Which, if we have humility, we are capable of making mistakes. But at the same time, it is not to perform that mistake and then posture it and put it higher than it is, as opposed to just, hey, this is not correct. Thank you for pointing out this not correct thing, and then moving on. And that's it. And it was like, a little small, a little small little interaction. Yeah, I mean, I I can't speak for Evan, but I know for myself, in most instances where it happens, I mean, where I'm misgendered, 
as, as horrible as it feels, uh, I, you know, we, we want to get through those moments as, as quickly as possible too. You know, we, we're not feeling great about it again. Like we're, we're hurting way more than you are not to like be super, like you're the bad person because you're not because you're learning. And honestly, I had to do a lot of work myself to learn. And it's that repetition. You just have to commit to understanding that your perception of the world is not the one and only means of perceiving the world and identity. And that's it. And it's okay to be, it's okay to be, to move out of that space because again, it's not being wrong. It's opportunity for growth. Just like you're not wrong for making the wrong turn at a theme park because it just is a new path for you to walk down. Yeah. And you might find it. Explore. It's a place that you didn't see. It's a, I didn't even know that there was a pathway over there and it could be a park you've been to a million times and you just didn't know until you noticed one time. Right. Or or in reality, it was just literally always there. Yeah. Or you find the dead end and then you turn around because you learned that that's the end of that pathway. Yeah. (laughs) Nothing wrong with that. It's just a, an opportunity for growth. That's it. Yeah, I think we're good to move on. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, okay. And then additionally, I think, so with these these images, we placed them here just to add more context to these, um, to the, oh gosh, brain, come on now. Uh, actions, to the actions that uh, I, I have seen personally, and I'm sure Evan can also say, when, when uh, cis people are, not being performative, but when they're, 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 they will wear um, pronoun pins or they'll put them in their, their you know, Zoom little names or their email um, signatures. Boy, words are hard today. Uh, you know, it's like a big part of exiting through the gift shop for us right now and like kind of going over these lessons is recontextualizing these actions and knowing that one, just doing these things for me, I can say at least relieves a lot of anxiety when I see them because I can see that I am entering a safe space. I'm entering a space that I know I can be me and I will not be criticized, you know? And I think that's important to know, but then, you know, to go beyond that, to understand the importance of why pronouns are so important to us, because in the end, we spent a lot of our lives either denying ourselves or living in and living in a society that denied us our truth. And pronouns aren't just words for us. They are another means of fighting against the loudness of either a body that isn't aligning with how we view ourselves, a face, a voice, or anything like that, or even things that might contradict how someone might view your gender. These these words are so important to us because <laughs> these things are so um, these things are so hard to defy against a society that pushes you down you know, to fight against that. And yeah, you know, and it may seem obvious to people that are in this system and in this society that like, of course, mine are she, her, or of course, mine are he, him, of course they are. But then you have to really ask yourself, why are they like, are they that because you feel that? And if they are, that's great, you know, but I think it's important to understand why they are and then why someone would decide to change them, you know? Why, you know, you feel so strongly that, no, mine are he, him. And it's like, well, now just transpose that onto this other person. <laughs> Guess what? We feel that 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 strongly about why I'm they, them, and why Evan's they, them. Because it's, that's, that is our truth, you know? And then that goes for the next slide as well. I mean, just more actions, creating safe spaces, making signage, all of these things are wonderful. Because again, for us on a surface level, we feel safe and we know that like, okay, great. <laughs> We're not going to be, you know, stared at usually or you know anything like that at least will be accepted in some way but again to recontextualize why safe spaces are important so we can live our truths because our truth has been denied and you know no one wants that (laughs) and in a sense uh just i i just uh, work with me here because i just i just thought of a really good point to to circle back to wayfinding this is wayfinding for us as trans people in the outer world. It is, it is. Because these are signs that tell us that it's safe. Yeah. It tells us that this person understands, that this person at least sympathizes and will hear and see me and not just associate me with the easiestly common color that they are blind to, yeah. where you know, there's certain people that literally don't have a word for, let's say like blue, so blue is green. So anything that's blue is also called green, which means that 
that makes me green instead of blue. And I'm, I'm trying to say that I'm blue. So in, in that sense, this is wayfinding for us out. And so you take that from the gift shop out with you. And then we know that it's awesome to also associate with you you know, when we see you with like a cute little keychain that is like a reference to like a theme park ride or something. And it's like, I love noticing that with people and their own little flair and the way that they express themselves. And it's still a way of wayfinding, uh, but just, you know, outside an extension of the larger trans experience. Absolutely. That's a wonderful metaphor. I love that because it's true. Because again, the world is very unsafe for us. I mean, it's safer than it has been, but it's also very difficult to know when someone won't really be accepting of us. It's the truth. They don't generally wear it on their sleeve. I mean, can he, you know, and if you do, we're just kind of doing the same thing we don't want them to do to us. We can't profile someone with a big truck and a trucker hat to think that they're not gonna like us, but it's hard because we think they might not like us. So it's important for these, you know, these little symbols and such but to understand why they're important as well. Wayfinding for us. All right, I think we have, I think we have everything. Did we, did we like, I think we, we, we have, we got a lot of memories, a lot of lessons, Evan. I think we're, we're, ready. In, we're in the parking lot. Uh, I don't yeah, know where are, I, but I'm exhausted. I'm in the car. I mean, I look, I know I said I'd take a picture of where we, where we parked and I'm uh, really sorry, but my phone, oh, well, my phone died. Pretend you didn't see this. My phone died and I don't, I'm so sorry. So we'll, we'll, we'll find it eventually. Oh no, here it is. Okay. I found the car, got my keys. All right. Oh, traffic. Oh, of course. It's going to be hours till we get home. Oh my gosh. Well, we're going to be sitting here for a while. Oh Jeez. man. Uh, well, oh. let's turn it back to you and the audience. Let's talk about our visit. I mean, what better what better opportunity? We're going to be sitting in this traffic for a while. Um, yeah, so like, let's talk about your thoughts about what we discussed. And I think there was one more. Yeah, and do we have do you have <laughs> any questions for me and Evan? Because I know that was a a whirlwind grand circle tour of the trans experience. Uh, I think I think it went pretty well, but yeah, let's uh, let's open it up for questions. Don't be shy. We will not bite. Oh, the audience is about thirty seconds behind us. Oh, interesting. Okay. If that's the case, do you want to answer a question that we've already yeah. been asked? Prior let's do to it. Yeah, we. So yeah, we. I I uh, posted um, a call for questions for this show on my Facebook page. I had a lot of responses. I really appreciate it. Um, let's start with a question from uh, Cynthia Sharp, whose pronouns are she, her. Uh, uh, what are good ways to intervene slash correct? Oh yeah, right. Uh, if you're a bystander who sees a colleague being misgendered or dead named, should you speak up? Yes, you should speak up. Um, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Evan, I think the best way is to just calmly state it out loud. Their name is blank. Uh, their pronouns are blank. I think it doesn't need to be, I think, I mean, I don't know. I can get kind of mean. <laughs> and I just like, blurt it out, just get it out and just state it. Um, but if you want to be polite, I would say just, you know, have an opportunity to like raise your hand or whatever in Zoom or in person when that finally does happen and just correct. Just as if, you know, a trans person was going to be doing it, I'd say. Yeah, I, I, I have nothing else to add. That's exactly what I would say. Let's see. You wanna pick one? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm I'm communicating with CJ via the Google Drive. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Got one from Maycat, my fiance, whose pronouns are she, her. And I'm just gonna say it; it'll pop up. Uh, what are neo pronouns? And uh, I, I can take that one. Is that it's. Uh rejecting normative pronouns those are going to be not necessarily just she her there or it is. 
beat him. They then um, takes us a step further. Um, and so that's like in our wayfinding and we were talking about pronouns and there were um, Zizir, Zazem, Ears also as well, or in a sense also just completely opting out of using pronouns. That's a form of neo pronouns as well, where it's just, for example, the late music producer, Sophie, Sophie, just goes by Sophie, no pronouns. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that being a whole nother, you know, facet of the larger trans experience is how it is radical. And as a result, there are ways in which you can construct language to better reflect oneself. But again, fluidity of language means that things are not in fixed absolutes, which then circles back to for one to truly understand non-binary, they, them, or expansive pronouns, step one, they can be more than plural. They can be singular, and it has been. And then the next step, and then the next step, and the next step is everything else about the experience of what that means. It starts with deconstructing your own understanding of what your grammar school teacher slapped you over the ruler with. Definitely. Yeah. I think the way that I like to uh, talk about how, why, why I use they, them is it properly communicates the plurality that I feel within me that I, I am, I, I'm not a singular <laughs> and, and it's, it's a, it's a matter of not identifying with any singular, like, you know, pronoun like he or she or any of the others, but I just don't, I feel more fluid in that way. And they connects with that. I am a, a, a plurality. <laughs> okay, let's see the, yeah, let's see the next one that I've gathered. Uh, one from my friend, Julia K, whose pronouns are she, her. And, her question is, uh, what does she, they mean? Oh, I could, I could answer that because I recently had to start doing that. And uh, oh, yeah. it definitely is a, is a microcosm to a larger discussion, which is here, you see, it's right there. They, them, they, them. It says they, them. It's on everything. It's on, it's on the email signatures, except, except. In my professional workplace, because the amount of work that it takes if I'm the first and last trans person through which most people that I have only passing interactions with, let's say a customer service experience is very similar to this as well. If you're working guest facing, it's also very similar. It could be that you go by both. It could be literally out of survival in the sense that they, them, but I have what people think is a man's name, except it's not. It's literally just a name. Evan can be anybody. But then also weirdly the nuance of seeing that in my last name and then people mess up and then forget this entirely. Uh, and so for my own safety to make sure that I'm not identified incorrectly because I am full, I am coming out fully. And again, this is me doing this out of my own choice and not because somebody is making me. And that is an important thing about the labor through which you are asking of trans people like myself or Natalie. I fully identify as a non-binary trans feminine person. Me too. I am non-binary. I have feminine features and would like to have at one point a woman's body. That does not mean anything other than what I just said, which means that for they, them, it's just they, them. I am non-binary in the way that she, they is, plurality and what Natalie was talking about as well, because there are people that can feel a larger spectrum of the experience and that is up to them and how they advocate for. And if you're unsure about which to use around that person, well, if you're unsure, why not just ask them? Cause you're already asked them and they're already advocating and you're already establishing a transparent dialogue in which it is safe to have this discussion unless they put up a boundary in which you then proceed no further and respect where that boundary was placed because it can always return to the ticket and start with ambiguity and then just continue that process. That is what you always take back with you wherever you go when 
trying to process something larger than what you understand yourself at that time. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. And I think uh, I have a slightly different experience with my, because I previously used she, they, before I went just straight to they, them. See, this is a problem too, to the audience. Uh, some of these questions are difficult for us to answer because there's different means of interpreting these different combinations and how one would maybe choose to use these. I would say uh, for me personally, it was, I didn't want to let go of femininity, but I didn't feel solidly like a, a woman or a trans woman. And that's why I chose she, they, because again, it, it, it seemed to like communicate more of a, you know, the, the plurality that I was talking about. But when it ended up, what ended up happening was that everyone would just default to she, um, which I, I would also add to this question. Uh, how do you use like a pronoun combinations like she, they? And I would answer her <laughs> interchangeably. Like you could, you could do it in the same sense and it's correct because it's identity. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, again, and that's the, that might not make sense, but again, like it, it's just a matter of practice because that's, you know, our, our brains are simple. They're, uh, they're, they're, they're just big, 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 big mounds of meat. <laughs> and they need to be kind of prodded a little bit in the direction you want them to go, but that doesn't make it any less valid. You're just kind of hacking it because, you know, training, in our society is strong because it's reinforced in every single thing we do. So, you know, that's it. Um, let's see, our next question from TETV's own Patrick Ling, whose pronouns are he, him, and I just spoke to this. Any trips on retraining your brain to use someone's preferred pronouns? And I, yeah, I said it, I mean, basically, I mean, Evan, like, I mean, it, it's, it's just repetition. Like we, like it, it says in the ticket, I mean, it's, it's that simple. <laughs> Through mindfulness and to reiterate, oh, I can't, you have to point to that's on your side, but it's, which, it is oh, down. It, which one? Is, not oh, a preference. Per preferred. Not a preference. Strike that one from the record. No, thank you. It's not preferred. It is our truth. Therefore it is. Yeah. And that's what not is to say the question is wrong, just that it's not a preference, because this is yeah. a great question. Return to the ticket, accept yeah. and internalize, repetition through mindfulness. Yep, that's it. Um, other, yeah, other, it just, I mean, basically, yeah, just recontextualize that it's like, it's, it's only preferred if there is a, a dominant culture idea that there is a standard, which is cis, right? It's a cis, a cis normative culture. That's why this preferred thing came about because suddenly there's like, oh, someone prefers something else. It's like, no, 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 no. It, someone is this. Someone is a trans femme, non-binary person. Someone's pronouns are they, them. It's not a deviation from the norm. It is the norm. Yeah. Um, we actually have a question in the comments from YouTube. Uh, Emily Lee would love to hear your opinion on folks wanting to petition putting pronouns on cast member team, cast member team member employee name tags. Um, well, I mean, this is speaking to a theme park environment, a, a business. I would say adding pronouns makes it more inclusive, thus more customers, thus more money. <laughs> I mean, like, if we're speaking to like a business mindset, doing these things is just good business because there's just going to be more people that are going to feel welcome in your theme park or your park. Yeah. Uh, unless I'm wrong on that, Evan. <laughs> I mean, nothing wrong with that. It, it's, it's it, you know, in the society that we live in, the reason why parks exist and the reason why they continue to exist, I might add, is as a result of them becoming more expansive, becoming more inclusive. That's like everybody getting in a huff about the changed uh, appearance standards for staff at Disney and stuff like that. And it's, you know, that's available labor. But in this sense, it's like, you know, a park started off with a very limited amount of people doing a very limited amount of things. It literally started with white, specifically Catholic men on Sundays with the first day off ever because they weren't be literally being worked to death. And then women were kind of allowed, but like on completely separate segregated grounds on the same property. 
and then add time and then maybe some people of color, but not really. It was very segregated for a long period of time. And we could talk about the systemic racism theme park some other day. But the point being is that it has begun to become increasingly expansive to cater towards as many people as possible. And so it is in a theme park or amusement center's best interest to project that image of inclusivity to as many people as possible, because if these are inclusive experiences, then they are expansive experiences. And if they're expansive experiences, then it only serves to your own benefit to make you more money and reinvest in more rides and hire more people and make more money and so forth. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, also it's mentioning our opinion. I think it's great. I mean, again, like, like, I mean, I think we were saying it. I mean, it's like adding pronouns are wayfinding for us in a theme park that's different. You know, it, it's like we feel more welcome. When I go to, I mean, even now, honestly, I feel very welcome in Disneyland. I can be me in Disneyland because they get, they have my back. I know they have my back because I'm spending money. <laughs> you know, it's that kind of a thing. But if you add the pronouns, it's like, sure. I mean, yeah, like ultimately it's all like just capitalistic decisions meant to be like towards the goal of making money. But like, that's kind of what the cards we've been dealt. And we have to kind of work within those boundaries. Yeah, it's frustrating, but it's what we have. I mean, that's kind of like what it's like to be a trans person. We're dealt the cards we're given. We're, we, we're like, well, I guess, okay, sure. I'm 6'1", and I love it. So great. I mean, is it what I would have preferred? What I've wanted? No. But here I am. So I think it's great. Sure. Absolutely. Um, we have another question from from Nicole Paris, my parish, who is a friend of mine from college. Uh, pronouns are she, her. Certain compliments seem to be seem to pertain more to certain genders, like pretty or handsome. Is it uncomfortable for non-binary people to receive to receive the, these compliments? How should I let my non-binary friends know they're looking good? <laughs> hmm. I mean, I think. You're awesome. I love being told I'm pretty. I don't like being told I'm handsome, but some people probably love hearing both everything or nothing and don't wish to be perceived at all. And so it's, it's really, true. you know, in terms of returning to the ticket and not, you know, making it specifically about pronouns, it's just start with ambiguity. And instead of time to ask for pronouns, it's time to ask, how would you like me to say that I think you look amazing today? Mm -hmm. And it can be a dialogue about that that then either talks about whether they want to be perceived for their appearance, whether or not you can help perceiving them. It, the, the, the difference here is that you want them to receive how you are seeing them. And so if that is the hope, then to respect them best would be to ask them because those words of affirmation, those, those words of affinity are, are so, so good when, when handled with care and with tenderness. And so if there is an ounce of being unsure, but you want to say, you look awesome, ask. Yeah. Hey, Natalie, what are words of affinity or affirmation that you like to hear to know that you look really great? I like pretty. I like that. I mean, that's mainly because I a map of signed male at birth and I didn't really get that a lot. So that makes my heart flutter, but that's why, you know, I also, yeah, I like pretty. I think that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> what about sure. you? It's, it's just like that. I, I love pretty. I love, I love being hot. Uh, I, I love knowing that I could have been and not could have not could have not past tense that I can be everything that I could not allow myself to be when I was younger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> So many weird rules I made for myself, but like oh. being asked that kind of question is disarming because it's like, oh, I love being told that I'm blank. Yeah. I've never heard it enough. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was handsome. I was always like really itchy. Didn't really get to unpack that till later in life. It's hard. Yeah. Or white suits just in general, if like they're not gendered in a certain way, just feel weird or anything like that. Absolutely. I mean, and just, just to reiterate, we're advocating for more connection. Ultimately, this is about connection, and that's something that our that our society doesn't really advocate for. It's stuff that happens. 
except for in the parks. Except for in the yeah. parks. Yeah. The parks advocate for connection. Everyone waves at each other at Disneyland. I love oh, yeah. waving at everybody. I feel so yeah. free. I, I get on. I, every, the train goes by. And I'm just like, hi. Oh my god, we're all connected. This is wonderful. So like, it's scary because we're not really taught how to connect. But I think if anything, if anyone takes anything away from this, it's like don't be afraid to one make a mistake because it's just as an opportunity to learn. And the second, like, don't be afraid to initiate. Don't be afraid to to be the one to ask, to be in the position of not knowing, because not knowing is a beautiful thing to, to have because it's an opportunity to be bigger. You're you are taking the step to be more than what you are right now. And like and trans people love that because it's it, it, you're trying, and that's like in the at the very beginning, that's all we really want at the start of it is just like an effort that someone sees us as different, but wants to include us, and does and they don't exclude our difference because they don't understand it or whatever. Like that's something that's important to me anyway. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We have another question from MJ, whose pronouns are she, her. Is it offensive to ask someone what their pronouns are? No, not at all. Nope. Uh, it, it, it's more offensive to assume. It's more offensive to ignore. It's more offensive to like, yeah. yeah. To, to make space and ask is the ultimate, like it's like the, the first step of like kindness, as far as I'm aware. What do you, what do you, what do you think of it? Be a star. Be a star. Why, why I, walk a star instead of worrying about offending somebody? Everyone. So what's, the, what's the trepidation about uh, the, you know, what, what causes the offense? What, what is an affront? Is it offensive to ask somebody their name when interacting with to humanize an interaction? So that's more than just service you provide. Thank you. Goodbye. I don't know. It's like, wouldn't you rather be, be friendly with your barista than bark at them about what your order is? Yeah. You know, then everybody's interactions are softer. So, you know, start with ambiguity if you're not sure and if you're still not sure you didn't offend anybody if you start with ambiguity because oh. you were a profile of them to begin with because you at least took pause to create the space in which they could engage and and you know open themselves and up widening that space widening it and when you when you're non-binary and someone does that and they can see that oh my god it's amazing oh <laughs> absolutely all right are we on time? Do we have, do we have time for a few uh, minutes? Oh yeah, it's only yeah we have like eight minutes, and cool. I think if we want to go over a little more, I want to. Let's see. Do, 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 do. I love my do 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 do. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, this is a good one. Um, give C, uh, CJ a chance to make grab a screen grab of this. This is from a friend of mine I've met in Florida, Shay Edward Lillard, whose pronouns are he, him. Uh, they previously engaged with me about these this sort of thing. Uh, I, asked, I asked you this once, but everyone seems to have a different answer. What is the formal non-binary pronoun? For instance, there is a miss and a mister as well as a sir and a ma'am. I casually use these terms and knowing what to call my envy friends would be super. Um, I would, I would, I would Oh, perfect. Um, I would say ask, right? I mean, because I don't know of any, really. Yeah, I, like I've seen like MX, uh, but that's not a fixed point uh, in the same way that as we've been talking about as who we are, are not absolutes or fixed points. And so it just, again, it drives a larger conversation. Because uh, again, it could be something that is opted out entirely. Because I'm not even sure. I, I'm not, I don't know if I'm comfortable with miss or misses. I mean, like I do if it's like a, uh, you know, I have to correct somebody and it's like a, you know, customer service call while I, you know, change my insurance or something. And it's like, okay, it's miss because I don't want to be called mister. Uh, but like, you know, it, it, in that kind of interaction, am I going to also unpack something even more esoteric? <laughs> So, you know, it depends on the situation and the context, obviously, but it starts with asking. 
Natalie, your audio is out. Yes, definitely. Uh, there is no one answer. Uh, ask, especially with your NB friends, because they might not have ever thought about it. Uh, I have my opinion, but like, I just don't like any of that because I think it's weirdly formal and it separates us into a weird server guess. You know, it just it's weird. It's like, eh. But but casually using it, ask. You know, they may not want to, and then you have to adjust your behavior, which isn't easy, but. That's kind of what we're asking here in the end. <laughs> I, I thought of a good example that isn't explicitly, but is spun off of like Mr. Mrs. Sir, Madam, et cetera. Is it's like people who even like play with the pun of like something like saying like babies or something oh, like, yeah. like babies and gentle them or something like that. But at the same time, depends. And all you can do is ask to make sure that that is not stepping on a person's toes. Because maybe that is uh, pejorative in a sense. It's it's a way of offending somebody because you're muddling the point of just saying that like, they are them. Uh, and so again, it's just have a conversation instead of put something out there that possibly could be uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, exactly. Um, let's see, line seven. I think this is our first anonymous. Mm -hmm. I think the only pronoun slash protocol related stuff that ever trips me up is when I'm talking about a friend who's transitioned, but revisiting a memory from before they did. How does one do this correctly? Uh, well, well, do you have, do you have an idea, Evan? I, I have something teed up, but I, I can't, I talk first every time. Ask them. Yeah, I would say ask them. Yeah, ask them. How would you like to be referred to? Um, I know me personally, I like uh, who I am now is who I always was, but I was denying that. So that's how I, how I think about it. And that's how I ask for people to refer to. I, I'm going to take that with me. I have not thought of it that way because I haven't really encountered that as much. It's quarantine. So there's like, as a large part of what has changed in me is not necessarily perceived by many others yet but sure, sure that's 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 beautiful thanks and i would yeah. say this is uh this is a this is like general use i there's there's certain like instances in like closer friends or you know my fiance that are a little different and there's different rules because there's different boundaries but like generally yeah it's that um it's a it's a it's a i'm gonna say weird it's a weird way, place to be where you lived as a person and you like most of who that was except for a pretty big part <laughs> and you're like you're holding all these balls and you're like i guess i don't like these but i like these so i'm gonna there okay but then is this still that person so yeah it's just I've, i always was who i am now i just was stopping myself but yeah, in the end yeah, so. yeah. 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 A friend um, of mine recently made a mistake about talking about a past memory. So it's just like, it's, it's very fresh for me to be like, oh, that's how I can posture it for, for her. Cause I'm not just going to name her, but just the, I can posture it that way and she'll see it and, and really get it. And, and it's like, it was a harmless mistake, but at the same time could have asked, but wasn't thinking and that's okay. That's why we made the ticket. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Simple step by steps. So we have our next question from Jason Solog, pronounce he him. What's the best way to discreetly ask a person about their pronouns? Hmm. Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> you should feel empowered. And if not, that's just going back to starting with ambiguity because yeah, yeah. it's not a discreet way. Like let's say there's a boardroom full of 50 people talking about some large construction project and you're of many people and you're just sitting in the corner. Probably not the best place to ask. No, and, and that's really good to bring out. After the meeting, totally. Yeah, yeah, pulling them aside, you know? I mean, it, I the way that I think about it, again, it's like you're asking someone's name. It's like, I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. What was it? And then it's like, otherwise, it's like, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your pronouns. What are they? And then that's it. But it's true. I really, I'm glad you brought that up, Evan. Use your brain. Don't just like, 
there are still there rules in our society. Right. And when you're in business and you're in a boardroom, you can't just like, hey, what are your pronouns? Like, you can't do that. That's not good. Like, if you want to keep your job, I guess. But yeah, after after a meeting or pull them aside, you know, I can imagine like in some instances, some trans people want that to not be a big deal because some trans people exist on more of a binary, which is awesome because I totally understand. Like, that's that's your goal. That's what you want. Perfect. Like, I know some of my friends who are more uh, binary trans, speaking like they went from, you know, AMAB to trans women or AFAB to trans man, and they're in that in that space, they probably may want to pass more. And, you know, having their pronouns asked needs to be more discreet in general. So, yeah, I mean, just find an opportunity. Swing them by their desk if we have desks anymore. God, I'm living in the past. <laughs> Throwing. Just to circle back to that, yeah. it, it being subjective to a larger cisgender society. And so just because somebody isn't passing doesn't mean wrong in the sense that being wrong is not with a capital W. So in that way, it's not necessarily fair to a person who is not presenting as cis, regardless of whether or not they are trans, to also out a trans person as well. Uh, so, you know, we like, let's say neither of us, putting our way, neither of us are in the room and there are people talking about us at no point should we be outed for who we are other than what our pronouns are, because what defines me for who I am is what I do and how I identify is not the directive through which I operate and design themed attractions and such. And in the very same way, that is also Natalie. We are who we are. And that means that when talking about us, when profiling us, it is not blank, a blank person who does theme parks. It doesn't lead with that. We are not defined by that unless it is like specifically when creating a bio about something that is detailing the trans experience. Like what we're talking about right now is pretty much like the one time, not one only time, but just in this instance, an example of a time in which we are talking about our identity in a way in which identity is something that we are discussing. But neither of us are in the room, for example. Don't be weird. Why would you be talking about that when you're talking about the fact that I have an encyclopedic knowledge or whatever about theme parks like that? That's what should be talked about, because I mm -hmm. think that that's way more interesting, but just like that's way less intrusive to talk about than something that's much more personal to me, okay. unless you're talking to me about it. We're not saying don't talk about it. It just means think about it, be mindful, and return to the ticket. Yep, always. All right, our next question, I think we're almost at the end, but let's try to get like two more in, I think, is from Cynthia Sharp. She, her, uh, uh, and where? Where are unexpected places where gender creeps in? What are some ways to handle it? Well, uh, it's everywhere. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess I, I'm not sure who who this is for. I guess this is for cis people and how to like mitigate gender. Yeah, yeah, it is. So, I mean, I think it's the ambiguity. It's the, the S in the star. It's like, like try to de-gender as much of what you do as possible. Like really ask yourself, is it necessary to gender things and like is it is it you know because again like Evan will agree it's it's everywhere it's like customer service experiences all over the phone like calling insurance companies calling the phone company calling the bank it's just like where, where all you have is your voice and you haven't changed your voice in any way that would align outside of like a male person like they oh it's the worst so I mean, like, as as individuals, where you have control over things, use gender neutral language. Don't assume like, all right, guys and gals. It's like, like, like I swear to God, I hear that every time. I'm like, because it's just you know, so yeah, because you didn't need it, and it didn't need, need it. it. There, and there's better words that better include a larger amount of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, Definitely like a big events as well. Like if you're in charge, like, I mean, this is an industry show. So let's think like we're, 
business related. I mean, it's like any messaging and like newsletters or like memos or, you know, you're at a conference and you're leading a, a panel, like address everyone neutrally because ultimately you like, what's that? Distinguished guests. Distinguished guests. Beautiful. <laughs> Honorable attendees. Honorable attendees. Oh my God. All right. We'll do two more. Actually, we'll see how long this one takes us because this is a pretty good one. And I want to make sure we address this. Oh, this is, this is the one that's the uh, example. This is the big one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And not to say that it's a, it's a bad thing that happened, but it's important to address. So this is from a friend of mine in college, Patrick Becker, pronounce he him. I had a neighbor in Seattle who identified as queer. They tried to explain to me to, the, to me this. To, sorry, they tried to explain this to me one day, to which I replied, "I don't care." I did not mean that I didn't care about them or their preference. I only meant that it had no bearing in my mind as to who they were or how I valued them. Unfortunately, it came across as as if, as if I didn't care at all. It was a very eye-opening experience for me. My neighbor was obviously hurt by my inadvertent flippancy towards their identity. How can people express a complete lack of lack of concern about a trans person's identity without disregarding a trans person's identity? I should clarify that they identified as non-gendered. Um, and I'm really glad that he asked this question because I think this is going to hit on a very important, uh, an important thing that I think a lot of cis people need to know in that when I, when I hear this question, I, what I hear is privilege. Would you correct, would you uh, agree, Evan? It, 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 it is, it, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's a privilege of where you have lived in a position where you get to decide what does and doesn't matter in society because you've been taught that because you are in the dominant position. And as a presumed man with uh, he, him pronouns, you have even more uh, privilege. And that's not your fault because that was what you've been given and that's the rules you've been taught, right? Um, and what you have the opportunity to do is unlearn this and understand that your way of perceiving value isn't the only way in that we as trans people demand space to be seen as who we are outside of a society that disregards us. And so in that instance, you follow our lead. When someone comes to you, opens up, especially a neighbor and says they're queer, they're, they're overcoming a lot of fear they're stepping outside of themselves to connect with someone that may hate them, may want to kill them, may see them as less than human. And so what I think, what I would recommend, and I wanna hear what you want, have to say too, Evan, is when someone comes to you with that kind of information about themselves, you open up and you thank them because that's all that needs to happen. In that instance, your opinion doesn't matter because you've had your opportunity to form your identity and have your sense of self and have you seen as you are for the most part, not to disregard, disregard people's inner lives. But when it comes to these kinds of things that have been repressed in society, you are there to learn. You're not there to pass judgment or give value. Just say thanks for sharing, even if you don't care. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you for Thank trusting me with that information. Thank you for, you know, it's a, this is, you're, you're, you were just welcomed to their private world for but a brief moment. Exactly. And it's, a, it's, it's a gift. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, the person saying, I want you to know me a little bit better than you do. Here's how. Yeah. yeah. Because these things generally don't align with how, we're, how we look. Sometimes they do, but we can't rely on that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good opportunity for growth and learning. And Patrick, thank you for sending me this question. I really appreciate trusting us 
with this kind of story because yeah, it's tough. It's tough to be in a position of like being wrong and learn, you know, absolutely. But thank you. Um, all right, I'm gonna do one, we're gonna do one more. We're gonna do one more. Uh, I wish we had like a fun one. There really aren't any fun ones. Um, let's see. I'm having fun. No, I, I know, fun. but you know, it's like, yeah, you know, you know what I mean? Not something that's, that's not so heavy, but yeah. I guess that's okay. Um, Ooh, do, 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 do. Oh, sure. Let's do line 10. CJ. This is from uh, Patrick Kling. Another, I think, a good question to address because sometimes people don't want to invest in growing. And sometimes people don't have open minds and open hearts. And I think this is what this is uh, addressing. So uh, Patrick Kling, he, him, any strategies, maybe a few tips in helping to convince people why it's so important to get pronouns right who don't understand or refuse. And I think uh, Cynthia Sharp also seconded this in my, in my thread, speaking specifically to business situations where um, companies that are based in less than liberal places and have employees that refuse to make space for that kind of thinking. I'm not I'm sure, not sure. honestly. I mean, first and foremost though, let people live their truth. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if that emotional labor, if you as a cis person are seeing that this emotional labor is offset to you as a result of that person's ignorance, it is worth asking yourself, is this relationship worth it? And obviously that's a difficult question to ask because is it somebody who you employ, who employs you? Is it a relative? Is it a lifelong friend who you've shared collective trauma with and therefore are somehow inexplicably indebted for some odd reason plus time? And obviously plus time makes everything more difficult when excusing somebody's inherently fundamentally inexcusable actions. And so is it worth it? Yeah. How much can you protect yourself when you are protecting these people whom you are trying to defend and create space for so that it's safer for them? And for them, I mean, for, for us as trans people and for just people of divergent affinity groups, larger than just what you know and what that person denies. Because usually the buck doesn't just stop there, which means that there's probably a longer list of other things that you have been excusing about said person's behavior with regard to accepting other people for living their truth. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard. No one's saying it's not hard because, you know, we've lost people uh, through, through being ourselves who fundamentally refuse to accept us for who we are, but we're better for leaving them in the past and we're better for leaving them behind. And it still hurts. It hurts every day. It's not like we had a choice about it because it's either a matter of survival or to be oppressed by a person whom we believed to have our best interests at heart. It, it's hard. It's obviously hard. But at the end of the day, really ask yourself, is this person worth it? Because you can't save everyone. And it's not about saving them. It's not about some kind of higher order of, of protecting people. It's just being a person. And if this person is yeah. refusing to be a person with you, let them live on their desert island with their 10 books that they read until the end of time or whatever Netflix shows they're binging. Like, they'll, they'll, they'll be miserable somewhere else and you'll be here hanging out on our cool beach party theme park fun zone. Like, <laughs> it just sounds more fun. The ball pit? Or literally anything else. Yeah, it's true. It, it, it really does come down to these difficult decisions. I remember I, I brought this question to another um, binary friend of mine the other night. And they, you know, they opened my eyes. Like you said, like it's, especially in a business situation, you know, you have to ask yourself, like, who is more valuable in the business for you? Like, you've hired, you've, you've hired everybody for a reason. 
And I'm not, I'm not like an MBA here. This is just like an emotional person trying to connect with business minded stuff. So please pardon me if I'm like overstepping my boundaries or anything like that. But it's like you hired everybody for a reason to fulfill certain tasks. It's a very pragmatic thing, right? And you know, on top of it, it's emotional because you might have found the other person, you know, friendly and nice and you, you want to hang out with them. And then you suddenly have someone who is asking to use different pronouns. You have a lot of people who like, like don't want to do that. And I guess, you know, what is more valuable? You know, what is the better business decision? I would argue inclusion. I would argue tolerance. I would argue more people being able to do what they want in within the bounds of your business, right? <laughs> I'm like stepping on actions. I, 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 but I mean, ultimately, I feel that these are the decisions to make. Like, you know, are they that valuable to you? Like you're saying, Evan. And yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's it. Are they valuable to you if they are somebody who are hurting people who you also love? Yeah. Is it worth justifying that hurt? Is it worth invalidating someone's experience to protect somebody? I would say it's not. It never is. Because the biggest part of us becoming who we are is overcoming the lies we were telling ourselves and the lies that society fed us about who we could be. And here we are. And I'm still alive. And I'm, I'm more alive and older than I ever could have imagined. And yet at the same time, always knew what I wanted to do with my life. But at the same time, I had a sense of a destination with no method of conveyance, no journey, just knowing this is what I want to do, but not who I would be to become that. Yeah. And that disconnect is something that I take with me everywhere I go. And it's not something I can just get back. But if you're taking somebody like that, that's holding you back by limiting themselves and by proxy limiting you from listening and being more expansive because you're, you're lying. And it's not that you're lying for any other reason other than like omission in a sense. Cause again, I came from a place where I was a liar about a lot of things about who I was and the relationships that I held that I had to completely deconstruct. Is it worth it? Yeah. And I mean, I think we'll end it on this one. I wanted to say one more thing just to kind of wrap up all of this and it really comes it really ties into this question and also as much as these things that we've talked about relate to the trans experience relating to how to interact with trans people in a more constructive um kind way with the ticket and everything like that um it's also just how one should interact with people <laughs> it's how we should interact with each other Absolutely. Not, just trans, not just trans people not just queer people, gay people, bi people, cis people. I mean, it's really a, a moment where we have the opportunity to come together as a whole, not as like trying to understand how to incorporate the other into the norm. It's deconstructing these, these, these labels and just coming together in a more mindful, kind way, kind to ourselves and kind to others as a whole. You know, which is also the future of theme parks. If, the if, it, if, it, if it, it's just I'm saying it's the future of theme parks because hear me out. Okay. okay. Theme park universes. Those are the next thing. Disney talking about like their own theme park in universe and then like Universal's Epic Universe. Like the, it's, that's literally the next step in theme park design is the next step in terms of integrating ourselves with society is that deconstruction of what <laughs> can be. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, I I feel like this is very successful. <laughs> I hope everyone. Thank you. Yeah, I hope everyone that's paying attention and listening and you know watching learn one thing. If you learn one thing, this was this was a success. Um, yeah, and CJ, if you could bring up the slideshow again, there's like the thank you slide. I think it's really cute. We need to end on that. Okay. Almost. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for, you know, yeah. taking time and opening your mind to new thing. Oh, we have a question. We um we definitely have a lot of questions left, and we have also the, like a question 
uh, uh, that are uh, big, big questions to answer. So we may or may not have another one of these that's a bit more um, mm, for straightforward. It's just kind of like, hey, we're talking about trans stuff. Uh, oh, you're, you're welcome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and you know, just be kind to one another. Be patient with yourselves. Be patient with people. We're also coming out of a pandemic. That's not fun. People are holding, having a lot of trauma right now. So just be kind. If we end on anything. Thank you, everyone. Evan, is anything for you? Last, uh, last words? No, but I can tell everybody about the unofficial pride mascot. It's Kuro. Kuro? This is a mascot from the 92 World Expo, but also... Wow. Whew. Boy, that's... I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Un I brought to you by a mascot from over 20 years ago i love it as it should be all right <laughs> thank you evan for all of your work i really appreciate it we've we spent like two months on this so i'm glad that it all came together thank you everyone well, you too thank you oh of course no this was a pleasure i feel so fortunate that i got to meet you and we got to like come together and present this in the way that we have it's important. And then I'd also like to thank Cynthia Sharp and Harriet B's daughters for putting us in contact with each other. Absolutely. Without Cynthia Sharp and Harriet B's daughters, we never would have met each other. That's awesome. All right. Do a big wave and we'll roll the credits. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>